<laughs> Welcome everybody to today's webinar, Resilient Equity Hubs Policy Finance Design in the Face of Sea Level Rise. Today's presentation is brought to you by Open Architecture Collaborative, the AIA Housing Knowledge Communities, and EDI International. I'm your monitor, moderator today, Tommy Burns. Um, I am a graduate of Roger Williams in Rhode Island. I uh, currently work in Boston with a primary focus on affordable housing. Um, I've also done some work in community development, uh, both internationally and in the States. And our first presenter today, Janet Kim, Jeanette, sorry, uh, her work focuses on design and ecology in relationship to public representation, interest, and debate. She's the assistant professor of architecture and co-director of the Urban Works Agency at California College of the Arts and founding editor of ARPA Journal. Her projects include design for the Oakland Coliseum neighborhood as part of the Resilient by Design Challenge, the Safari Tours on Urban Ecology, the Pinterest Headquarters, National AIDS Memorial, and the Fall Kill Creek Master Plan. She is also the author of the Underdome Guide to Energy Reform. Our second presenter will be Paul Penninger. Paul specializes in applying rigorous economic analysis to complex urban development, policy, planning, and public finance projects. He has more than 23 years of experience in city planning, real estate, feasibility analysis, housing policy, and community development. Paul is the director of AECOM's design, planning, and economics practice in the Pacific region of the United States and also leads economic projects related to sustainability and resilience across the Americas. As both an urban planner and economist, Paul focuses on the policy and planning intersection between economic feasibility, planning, and sustainable development. He has been appointed lecturer in land economics for the Master of Urban Design program at the University of California, Berkeley, since 2002. He also currently serves as a member of the Housing Subcommittee of the Association of Bay Area Government's Regional Planning Committee and sits on the San Francisco Bay Area Planning and Urban Research Association Urban Infrastructure Council. And our last presenter will be Brad. Brad is a, an associate at David Baker Architects in San Francisco. He joined DBA in 2013, inspired by the firm's commitment to creating dynamic architecture that engages its urban, social, and ecological context. Brad was project architect for Pacific Point, the first 100% affordable housing development completed in the new Hunter's Point shipyard neighborhood of San Francisco. He's currently leading Brady Block, a 600 unit mixed use development that reimagines a full city block on Market Street in downtown San Francisco. Believing that wonderful design is needed most by those who cannot afford it, Brad regularly devotes time to pro bono efforts. Most recently, he designed Spark Spark It Place, a pop-up business incubator and community gathering space on an underutilized West Oakland parking lot. Prior to joining DBA, Brad gained experience at leading design practices, including James Corner Field Operations in New York and public architecture in San Francisco. Today's learning objectives, uh, we will learn how designers can address near-term risk to affordable housing, economic opportunity, health and access to open space in a way that can adapt to long-term risks such as sea level rise. 
learn about the leading policy and finance strategies affecting affordable housing and wealth creation in disinvested urban areas and explore how they can be realized and expressed through design at urban and architectural scales and learn how to create interactive scenario planning tools and analyze potential design impacts to make informed and creative decision making and learn about strategies for building coalitions across disciplines and with community-based organizations. And of course, description today, building resilient cities means starting with communities on the ground as well as regional economic and ecological systems. It means addressing immediate challenges such as housing affordability, gentrification, public health, and access to resources, as well as the long-term risk of climate change. And yet, our structures for governance and ownership often align with jurisdiction and property boundaries that struggle to address the scale of coordination necessary to support health, wealth, and stability. The speakers in this webinar will share experiences addressing these challenges and testing them with community-based organizations in deep East Oakland. Their team, the All Collective, All Bay Collective, was one of 10 teams selected to participate in the Resilient by Design Challenge, for which they developed designs and strategies for the San Leandro Bay, Oakland Coliseum neighborhoods. Speakers will unpack their proposal to create a regional commons at San Leandro Bay with a focus on the creation of resilient equity hubs, REHBs. These alliances among agencies, community advocates and residents can leapfrog, leapfrog jurisdictional and property boundaries to achieve common stewardship and deliver shared benefits. At the strategic level, REHBs leverage shared governance arrangements and special districts such as Community Benefits District, Geological Hazard Abatement District, and Eco District to fund resilient infrastructure and affordable housing made possible through scaled up support for accessory dwelling units, affordable housing incentives, and community land trust. In this way, REHBs will, engage, will enable residents to stay where they are even as the tides rise. REHBs can support social and economic resilience by building shared equity. If you have any questions during today's presentation, please submit them in the chat box. Uh, any technical questions will be answered uh, right away, and any content-related questions we'll get to in the uh, towards the end of the webinar. Please take a moment to look over the copyright materials and the compliance statement. Right. And without further ado, I'd like to uh, introduce our first speaker, Jeanette. And I will pass off to... Great. Hi. Hi, everyone. Um, thank you so much for joining. We're really happy that you could join this webinar. Um, can everybody hear me and see the screen? Okay. I'm going to assume that that's a good thing. Um, so yeah, um, as Tommy mentioned, the three of us um, were part of this Resilience by Design, Resilient by Design Bay Area Challenge. And we thought we'd use this webinar um, as a chance to do something of a deep dive into the social justice aspects of our proposal. Um, so we'll, we'll spend today to kind of unpack ways in which we've bridged across design, policy, and finance. And then in the last, let's say, 20 uh, minutes of the session, we'd especially welcome your comments and feedback. Um, to spark a conversation. Um, so as Tommy mentioned, our team is called the Albay Collective. It's comprised of AECOM, CMG Landscape Architecture, California College of the Arts, UC Berkeley, David Baker Architects, Sylvestrum, Skio, and Modem. And um, we also worked closely with community-based organizations, including the East Oakland Collective, Oakland Climate Action Coalition, Merritt College, and many others as well as an extensive network of city and state agencies that are shown here. Um, so our focus was on San Leandro Bay, 
Um, it's an estuary in the East Bay and it connects deep East Oakland. Um, I don't know if you can see my cursor move, but it connects deep East Oakland, Alameda Island and Bay Farm Island. And we just felt really lucky to work here um, because of the way that equity issues here are just so closely interwoven into complex ecosystems and really critical infrastructures. So, um, you know, here we have BART, AirTrain, Regional Rail, Interstate 880, um, and the Oakland Airport, which all offer a real wealth of infrastructural resources. But they've also really carved apart neighborhoods and habitats. So this prized marshland that you see, homes and businesses are all quite vulnerable to coastal, riverine and groundwater flooding. And perhaps most urgently, Deep East Oakland is reeling from the legacy of redlining, disinvestment and other continuing forms of structural injustice, um, things that are evidenced by high poverty rates and environmental health burdens today. Um, the neighborhood is also subject to you know, the baywide gentrification pressures that I think the whole area feels um, that are here made even more acute as two and possibly even three professional sports teams have decided to leave the site, um, raising questions about its future development. So we've heard loud and clear from our partners that we need to address immediate challenges like housing affordability, gentrification, public health, and access to resources as well as the long-term risk of climate change. So we believe that the first step towards resilience has to be to secure communities in place and empower them to build wealth in sustainable and systemic ways. Um, these are approaches that I think very much build on the extraordinary legacy of community organization in Oakland, from the shipbuilders unions after the war and the Black Panthers to the permaculture nonprofit that you see here, which is called Planting Justice. Um, and right now our collaborators are stewarding a process of community-based resilience planning with a state grant that they secured previous to RBD called Transforming Climate Communities. And they're working with input from our team's proposal and are using a few of the decision-making tools that we've created. So to respond to these challenges, we call our proposal the Estuary Commons to reference the way that a commons joins together people in place through a kind of shared management of resources. Um, so I'll give a brief overview of our um, main design approaches. And then, as I mentioned, we'll just zoom into some of our equity related strategies in a moment. And we have four main moves, um, catalyze, adapt, stitch and prosper. Um, the first is to catalyze wealth creation within existing communities. Um, this, for example, creates the creation, uh, includes the creation of a community benefits district that can help capture increasing real estate value for local benefit. More on this in a moment. The second approach is to adapt the edges of the estuary. Um, so um, sloughs and flood control channels are widened and stepped back and uh, living levees are built along the shoreline, um, really all to set the stage for marsh accretion and habitat restoration, as well as, of course, the reduction of flood risk. Um, this would also create a kind of continuous loop that you can see in orange of multi-use trails um, and public parks. The third approach is to stitch neighborhoods um, and the shoreline together through green corridors, which are strangely actually here drawn in orange, but you can imagine that they're green. <laughs> um, so these would be corridors frequented by bikes and public transit, as well as our friends, the red fox and steel fret, steelhead fish. Um, we've also proposed bundling transit um, and I-880, so from its former location into this kind of um, line, con linear connection over here. Um, the advantage here is that we could open up pedestrian connections to the bay, we could filter exhaust before it reaches the neighborhood and create a new transit hub, which you can see here on the left. The fourth approach, PROSPER, addresses the need to make whatever kind of development the city proposes resilient and affordable. Brad, Brad will expand on this, but in brief, uh, to make new construction resilient to groundwater and liquefaction. Um, we propose creating floating tidal cities on excavated lagoons and canals. 
So here you can see how the four main design approaches basically layer together. And we hope that you'll see this less as a single master plan and more as a kind of design scenario in which these tools of the commons can emerge. So we see the estuary commons as this kind of network of communities um, really joined together in uh, mutual obligation for the benefit of all. All right, so let's go deeper into our equity and affordability related strategies. And as, as Tommy mentioned, uh, this, this aspect of the proposed proposal um, really rests on this idea that we're calling resilient equity hubs or REBS. Um, so to set the stage for this, you know, we could consider this map, um, which shows 101 cities, nine counties, and scores of priority development and priority conservation areas um, across the Bay Area, all overlaid with watersheds. And you know, maps like these, I think, remind us that natural hazards just don't follow political boundaries. Um, and yet, because we manage budgets and plans within these jurisdictions, we often lack the capacity to address this, the true scale and complexity of climate resilience. So in response, REBS would basically consist of alliances among existing agencies and advocates and residents. Um, REBS would basically use policy and finance strategies like the ones you see here at scales that range from a watershed to the individual. Um, and Paul will expand on these strategies, um, but for now I thought I'd focus on a few that most closely align with our urban design approaches. So at a neighborhood scale, um, a REB could leverage what are called value capture financing strategies. Um, so this could basically leverage investment in flood proofing um, and uh, transit, transit infrastructure that you see in green um, or, 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 or light pink for transit oriented development areas. And this could basically create a fund that's governed by a participatory budgeting process, so by the neighborhood. Um, so, you know, both spatially and financially, this basically creates a kind of exchange across the neighborhood. Um, this fund, for example, could support affordable housing, um, daycare, or even community-owned solar um, with an initiative that the Oakland Climate Action Coalition is already exploring. And I think this is super important because it can provide income for neighbors, um, it can reduce greenhouse gas emissions, and it can even keep the, run, uh, keep the city running even in a disaster, in a blackout. Um, okay, so next let's zoom in a little bit further. Um, and here, REBS can form alliances across property boundaries really to address housing displacement. Um, so this could involve cooperative ownership um, through methods like a community land trust. Um, so as you may know, CLT residents own buildings individually um, and they own land collectively, which means that no one landowner alone would bear the cost of rising insurance, for example, or of pumping out groundwater. I think this is a really interesting arrangement, um, especially given that we, we, I think we'll have to rethink what land ownership looks like as tides rise. Um, so CLTs, for example, could waterproof homes um, and build new housing and do so in a way that's incremental, that changes incrementally. Um, it could keep existing residents in place, um, either in their homes or even just within the CLT more generally. Um, and importantly for affordability, um, because CLTs also limit resale value, um, housing would stay affordable in the long term, even as the neighborhood changes. So I think with all of these things in mind, we could imagine how the neighborhood could look several decades from now. Now, um, from a design perspective, it was really important for us to create a formal language of diversity and variety and multiplicity. Um, and this would reflect the, the sort of financial reality that you know, a small business incubator or a vendor mart at Bart and a grocery store down the street could kind of all emerge in, um, in various ways, in, in varied ways. Um, Secondly, we also wanted to create uh, kind of scalable pockets of collective space. So if you think back to the, what that community land trust diagram looked like, you know, we could see that cooperative housing in one area could, um, could also start to expand to, to uh, um, support new construction that could all be kind of connected around a shared green. Um, we also saw opportunities to really activate roofscapes um, in relationship to the kind of undulating ground that stitches across these, this bundle of int infrastructural connections. Um, and so this could use solar, community-owned solar to really open up new spaces for the commons. 
I think it's also just important to remember that cooperative ownership can be fun. Um, so things like access to barbecues and a tool library, I think really introduce neighbors to each other. Uh, intergenerational care enables a single parent to go to work. And I think it's really soft infrastructures like these that can amplify the social resilience that's already there in the neighborhood today. So to sum up, the idea, the hope here is that REBS can enable residents to stay in their communities and really build shared equity. And we see this as a critical step towards enabling adaptation, but without displacement. All right, so now that I've introduced some of the more general principles behind REBS, um, I'll hand it over to Brad, um, who will show how REBS have informed our designs and can really work in parallel with other affordability strategies. Hi everyone. Um, sorry, a little technical <laughs> shuffling going on. Um, I'm, I'm Brad Lieben. Um, I'm with David Baker Architects in San Francisco and i um, really excited to share this work with, with um, everyone today. Uh, thanks for joining us and thanks to the AIA and to the Open Architecture Collaborative for hosting. Um, I'm with David Baker Architects. We are um, a, an architecture firm in San Francisco um, we're really kind of a mission-based firm. We believe that um, that housing is sort of the basic building block of, of vibrant cities and that housing is a fundamental uh, right. And um, we um, are really pretty focused on affordable housing, um, both in the Bay Area and nationally. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. And so um, we, we were approached by um, the, the um, All Bay Collective team um, a little bit late in the game um, to help them come up with some affordable strategies for the site. And, and the reason for that is that, um, and Paul's gonna talk about this a little bit more, is that the, the team sort of took this very holistic look at what, what resiliency is. And so it's not, you know, resiliency, we typically think of the ecological side of it, but to, to really um, be resilient, we, we were looking at it um, from a social, ec economic, governance, and ecological standpoint. And so, um, and so they, they understood that in order to um, even begin to address resiliency, we first need to start to look at some of the very serious gentrification displacement challenges that um, the neighborhoods that we're working in are facing. Um, and so we were asked to, to join the team and we were really excited and um, said, uh, said, yeah, let's, let's do it. And, so, and what's the site? And so they said, um, well, this is the site. And, and, um, and I was like, you mean like, the, the whole thing. And they were like, yeah, this whole site. And so this is a very large, very complicated site. And Jeanette talked a little bit about it already. Um, it encompasses three municipalities, Oakland, Alameda, and San Leandro. Um, there's the Coliseum site, which is very much in flux for the reasons that Jeanette discussed. Um, the Oakland airport is there. Um, and it's also a site, as Jeanette mentioned, that's very um, sort of divided um, by um, some unfortunate transit infrastructure planning decisions that were made a long time ago. Um, there's uh, the 880 freeway, there's BART, the Amtrak lines that really cut up the neighborhood, and then there's Hagenberger um, Road, which um, sort of acts like a highway cutting east-west through the neighborhood. And so um, while our, our overall vision for this site is, you know, is really oriented around stitching across these, these divides and creating a more um, connected um, connective tissue, um, when I talk about the, our affordable housing strategies, I'm going to talk about different zones because each one is so different. They each require sort of different approaches. But um, while I'm talking about it in this sort of um, in this differentiated way, the goal here, of course, is to sort of stitch things back together. And I'm going to and and I'm going to start by talking about um, the existing neighborhood fabric, um, which I, I have highlighted in blue here. Um, so. And also just mention that um, overall for the whole site, not just the existing neighborhood, our, our goal was to achieve 50% um, um, of all new housing to be affordable to uh, moderate, uh, low income and very low income households. Um, and so within the, the existing neighborhood, um, the, the goal was to kind of protect what's there, um, you know, not make wholesale changes, but um, to look for more sort of strategic surgical ways of adding affordability into the neighborhood. Um, and there was a few ways that we went about that. Um, there's actually a new transit, um, high-speed bus rapid transit line being planned for International Boulevard um, and sort of at the top of the screen there. 
And so um, we, we were looking towards um, uh, at some, we identified some um, sort of uh, TOD um, catalyst zones that are highlighted in pink along international as potential sites for incentive upzoning in exchange for market rate development, including um, some percentage of, of below market rate housing. Um, and then also setting aside a certain number of parcels for 100% affordable housing developments. And then within the existing neighborhood, there's actually quite a few vacant lots, some of which are large enough to support multifamily 100% affordable. So our plan calls for those to be rezoned to allow for that. And then of course the community land trust model that Jeanette talked about, um, which in addition to sort of fostering a kind of social resilience within the community um, land trust also has an affordable component that Jeanette mentioned. Um, and one of the interesting things is that even though the existing fabric is actually, whoops, I'm gonna go back, kind of tucked, pulled away from the shoreline, um, there's this issue of groundwater rise, which affects um, quite a bit of the, the existing neighborhood fabric. And so we developed this um, strategy around accessory dwelling units or ADUs. Um, ADUs um, are actually allowed in all three of the municipalities that we're working in. Um, and the idea here was um, that if you're building an ADU, in, a property owner is building an ADU in, on their property, and it's in an area that's vulnerable to groundwater rise, they have to build it in a way that's elevated or protected from the groundwater levels. Um, and if, and then they, what happens is they generate some income because they can rent out this accessory dwelling unit. And if they're charging market rate rents, our idea is that they'd be required to also upgrade the existing structure on the site. And so it's sort of a bottom up way um, of increasing um, housing supply in the neighborhood, as well as um, resiliency over time. Um, and then I'm gonna talk uh, lastly about um, our affordability strategies in the areas I've highlighted in orange, which are the Oakland Coliseum site and the golf course, which are sort of more tabula rasa sites in a lot of ways, where we can be a little bit more visionary with our approach. And they're also kind of right on the water's edge and so a little bit more vulnerable. And then in red, I've highlighted um, the high density transit corridor, um, where we see a lot of potential for um, mid to high rise development. Um, I'm gonna talk about tidal cities first. Um, the tidal cities concept is this idea that we sort of excavate and create these ponds. Um, and then the land that's been excavated creates protective berms. Um, and the idea with the ponds is that we can actually create a new form of floating housing that rises and falls with water levels. So it's more resilient and less vulnerable. Um, this is what a tidal city looks like. This is the Coliseum site, and I'm gonna come back to this. Um, but I wanted to talk a little bit about the typologies that we imagine there. Um, these are, this is a mid-rise structure um, that six to eight stories that would be built on piles. Um, it's great because it can provide higher density, mixes of uses like an active ground floor, but it's um, the cons are that it's sort of fixed in place. Um, the, gr the ground floor can be floodable, it has to be raised up, um, and it's expensive to build on piles like this. Um, the other, another typology we looked at is uh, floating, um, two to three story walk-up flats. And, um, which is great because of the, the floating nature, they're less vulnerable, they can rise and fall with the water levels. Um, the con is that they're a little, they're more dense than single family, but um, they're kind of uh, residential only, so not really mixed use and, and relatively low density. Um, single family floating homes, which we, we didn't actually really propose. And then um, small craft liveaboards, boards, which we kind of stumbled upon as a really great affordability strategy. They don't take up much space. They're way less expensive than buying or renting a home in the Bay Area. Um, you only have to pay slip fees and um, relatively low cost for the for the boat. And then um, and and they require relatively little infrastructure, um, but you know that they're kind of low density. Um, so we want to provide space for those liveaboards on our in our Tidal Cities plan. And this is a section through the Tidal Cities. You can see the excavated pond with two to three story walk up residential flats. And then on the berm, um, raised up is where the streets are. And there we have these mid-rise um, structures that can have active ground floors, um, a mix of uses that step down to the residential ponds. Um, and so again, this is the Tidal Cities plan on the Coliseum site. Um, we had the mid-rise structures built on kind of straddling those berms. Um, and they're oriented such that they kind of uh, shape the views out towards the bay. Um, and these blue kind of irregularly shaped and circle buildings, these are the ideas of community centers. Um, the idea that you know, your, each pond is kind of becomes a community and that there's social resilience and there's shared facilities. 
Um, and zooming out a little bit, um, I'm going to talk about the affordable strategies here, um, both on the golf course site and the Coliseum, Title City that I've highlighted in black. Um, we had a mix of community land trusts in the residential pond sort of enclaves, um, and then the mid-rise berm buildings um, would either be uh, a mix of inclusionary housing or one, some lots would be set aside for 100% affordable. Um, and then on the higher density transit corridor, where we've relocated the highway and, um, our, and, and sort of straddles the transit lines, um, we're looking at mid to high rise structures um, and um, a certain percentage of 100% affordable development and, um, and, a, and a mix of, and, and, and then incentive upzoning for developers to include below market rate housing. And um, as Jeanette mentioned, there would be sort of um, income, in, income transfer from the, um, the new development here to community benefit uses within the existing neighborhood. And I'm going to end on this image of Title Cities. Um, this is in one of the residential ponds with the two to three story walk up flats in the foreground and the mid rise mixed use building stepping up to the berm beyond. Thank you. I'm going to hand it over to Paul. Sure. Thanks, Brad. Um, once again, this is Paul Tenninger from AECOM, and I'm going to talk a little bit about funding, financing, and implementation. As Jeanette and Brad have already described, the SRA Commons comprises an extremely rich set of proposals, all grounded in the fundamental belief that building resilience requires new models of governance, which are cross-jurisdictional, collaborative, and community-based. I'm going to talk a bit about how we approached developing a funding and financing framework for the SRA Commons, including the tools that we developed to engage the community and key stakeholders in thinking about how they can make trade-offs between different design and policy proposals at a variety of scales. Understanding, of course, that there are limited resources, both public and private, to do everything that we're proposing. And we do need to make, as I've said, some tough early choices um, to ensure the feasibility of our proposals. So at a practical level, um, we wanted to make sure that um, we were grounding our funding and financing and implementation proposals in some key principles. And just in brief, those key principles are that solutions, design solutions should be cooperative, cross-jurisdictional, and community-based. That new sources of both traditional and alternative finance would be needed to augment public resources. That we need to rely on evidence-based policy tools like the community resilience um, investment decision-making tool that I'm going to talk about in a minute, um, and that community benefits should be clearly articulated. So we spent a lot of time working with our uh, with our stakeholder partners and, and community groups defining what community benefits need mean rather in the SRA Commons, and of course things like affordable housing, parks, open space and recreation, transit service and enhanced mobility, jobs, programs for youth, community gardens. All of those are very important, but that there was much more um, that went into this. And our, our full report, which is available on the resilientbayarea.org website, goes into some greater depth on the kinds of community benefits that, that we're talking about here and that are um, really listed in depth in the equity checklist that we, that we worked with um, for this project. So first of all, for the community investment decision-making tool, um, go back, Brad. One, just go back one. Thanks. No, no, no the first one. There. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry, everybody. Um, so we have a we have a tool that we've developed at Acom that's very similar to a tool that other other folks in the industry have used called a triple bottom line framework. And the triple bottom line is essentially a way of looking at social and environmental outcomes or returns on investment in addition to the traditional financing measures of return on investment. We wanted to add a, a whole different um, category to the traditional triple bottom line model for this process. Um, and um, that category is governance. And we really felt that governance and sort of elevating governance outside of, um, of the traditional framework was really important because we think that it's only through uh, cross-jurisdictional and cooperative models of governance that we're going to be able to achieve the goals that we want to achieve uh, around resilience and estuary commons. 
So the community investment decision-making tool, or as we've come to call it informally, the quadruple bottom line tool, or QBL, um, is essentially a series of linked Excel workbooks, or worksheets rather, and associated pie chart outputs that we um, can use to analyze different scenarios or different specific designs or investments to understand how they can move the needle from the current base case to what will happen if you implement all of those, all of those different designs or investments. So now we can go through. I'm going to show this is what the current base case looks like according to um, the analysis that we did. This is what happened today in all of the, the very complex um, uh, um, uh, areas around the estuary comments. So in Alameda, Oakland, San Leandro, and all of the various jurisdictions working together right now. This is kind of what the current base case is. And so you can see mostly um, according to the governance, finance, social, and environmental categories that we, and criteria and indicators that we define for this, not doing so great. If all of the current plans, sort of the incremental separate current plans that have already been adopted by um, the various jurisdictions and entities around desperate commons were implemented, this is what, this is what the, um, the outputs would be. So some improvement, particularly in relation to governance and environment, and finance and a couple of the social indicators. And then finally, if all of the estuary commons, there you go, if all of the estuary commons um, proposals were implemented, um, this is what the final outcome would be. So you can see a, a significant improvement um, along all of the different criteria and indicators that we developed as part of this. Now, of course, this is just one this is just one scenario or set of scenarios, and um, you could apply this, this community investment decision-making tool or QBL to, um, to other scenarios or to other investment or design ideas. And, and the idea is that we turn this over along with some of the other tools to our community partners as an open source tool that can be used going forward to help, uh, to help inform decisions. Another tool that we developed that um, under the, the guidance and leadership of Jeanette um, was our ABC In It Together game, which is essentially a, um, a board game um, that forces stakeholders from diverse sectors of the private sector, government, and the community to work together to find collaborative solutions for building resilience. And it uses the estuary commons, as you can see uh, on this slide, as the game board, and the constituent projects as the pieces that can be played by the, by the participants. So this is worthy of an entire webinar on its own, but um, once again, you can learn more about this in our, in our report that's on the Resilient by Design website, um, and also uh, I'm sure there will be many opportunities going forward to, to, to work with this game. We found it to be an extremely effective way to um, engage with, uh, with stakeholders at a variety of different levels. So now, before ending and opening it up to questions, uh, I want to talk just about a few of the specific funding and finance tools and sources that we worked with, and then how we applied those specific sources to both near-term and long-term projects. You get a little bit more granular about how we're matching up sources with specific projects. The types of fund funding and financing tools and sources that we talked about and that, that Brad and Jeanette have already mentioned um, included value capture. So in California, um, since we don't have uh, kind of formal tax increment financing available to us anymore, we have a variety of different value capture schemes, including things like enhanced infrastructure financing districts and community facilities districts. We also um, have uh, considered social and environmental impact bonds, multi-jurisdictional revenue sharing and funding pools, special districts, most importantly a community benefits district that could be formed in the near future in D.C. Oakland to allow community members there to have a seat at the table in investment and, and policy decisions. State and regional funding measures, uh, most importantly in the short term, California's Proposition 68, which is a $4 billion bond measure, which was just passed, um, that um, provides funding for water, environmental, and parks projects with a, with a priority focus on areas um, that, that face various environmental justice issues. And then finally, community development finance, which I'm including in that bucket, um, things like low-income housing tax credit financing, new markets tax credits, and community land trusts and housing trusts. Some of our near-term projects, these are things that we thought could be achieved in the next one to 10 years, included peak and floodplain restoration and enhancements. And primarily, we see these as being funded through um, funding sources. So 
uh, grants, recoverable grants, no and low interest loans, and primarily federal, state, most importantly state, and regional funding measures. So Proposition 68, as I mentioned, uh, the San Francisco Bay Restoration Authority Measure AA, which is a regional measure, social and environmental impact bonds, and um, other sources of government and, and uh, state and regional funding. Also, bicycle and pedestrian connectivity improvements, we thought, were something that could be funded in the near term. And um, there are sources of funding available through the MTC, the, the regional council governments here in the Bay Area. Um, Alameda County's measure BB, which is a transportation funding measure, and potentially community benefit district funding. Over the longer, so this is just one of the, the short-term projects, um, the Damon Creek um, SLU project that could be funded through one of these near-term solutions. Over the longer term, uh, we really understand that for things like Bay Shoreline Restoration and Enhancement, tunneling and realigning I-880, and then creating the multimodal um, uh, uh, mixed-use district that we, we'd like to see created here, and then tidal cities, that these longer-term design solutions and investments are gonna require a whole um, array of different funding mechanisms, um, including, most importantly, value capture, so EIFDs and community facilities districts, um, social environmental impact bonds, and then we think also um, tools that are emerging that haven't been fully um, developed yet in the industry in North America, but we think that are coming are things like insurance-related climate adaptation securities. So uh, these are longer-term uh, ideas and for which a lot of um, pre-development feasibility analysis still needs to be done, and which we think are, are tools um, like the community development, community investment decision-making tool and um, in a together game can also help to kind of continue to refine and help us to focus on the kinds of solutions that are going to meet multiple objectives. This is what one of the longer term uh, solutions looks like. This is the realignment of I-880 and the, the resulting mixed use multi mixed use uh, multimodal center that could be developed on the Coliseum side. So with that, um, I'm going to turn it over to Q and A and um, I think that Tommy is going to is going to facilitate that. Thank you. Yep. Thank you very much, guys. Can you hear me okay? Yep. All right. Um, uh, first question here. Um, what is the plan for implementing this vision and how is the resilient Bay Area challenge pushing this project forward? Well, um, so the RBD organization continues to work on a variety of fronts to bring together um, different stakeholders, including funding entities, uh, not just around the estuary commons, but around all of the other um, major major project sites. So um, I would say that in answer to that question, it's not just one plan. Um, it's It's probably over the long run a variety of different plans that will need to be implemented at the level of the estuary commons and um, that involve the city of Oakland, Alameda, city of San Leandro, most importantly the community groups, um, and a variety of other entities, the airport, the port of Oakland. Um, you know, this is this are this is something that's going to be taking shape over the course of the next um, several years. And I think that it's um, it's going to take a lot of collaboration and coordination amongst all of the entities. That's kind of our, our, our underlying theory here is that it's not just going to be one plan or one entity that's going to achieve this, it's going to be multiple. Um, I'll just add one quick thought to that as well. I agree with everything Paul just said. Um, the, um, I mentioned briefly that a, a number of community-based organizations that we've been working with um, have received that state grant uh, called the Transforming Climate Communities Grant. And so that um, planning process is, is underway right now. And I think what's really exciting about that is that it is an entirely community-driven uh, process that done in partnership with Oakland Planning. And so I think that is gonna be one really important next step for um, this area. And I think that the work that we did with RBD um, also kind of widened that circle to involve a lot of the other agencies and you know, the airport and Alameda Island um, and so, so all of those members now kind of have a seat at the same table and are kind of um, working towards next steps as well. 
Um, are there uh, politicians that uh, are are talking about this a lot? I wonder if, uh, as elections come up, if um, some are more interested in this than others. Can you repeat the question? I'm sorry. Wondering if any um, of the local government, uh, uh, maybe the mayors, if, if any of them are jumping on board with this, some are more interested than others. I can't speak specifically to um, the the mayor of Alameda or the mayor of San Leandro or, or even the mayor of Oakland, but I, I know that a, a variety of elected officials from all of those jurisdictions and, and um, appointed officials as well have been involved in the Resilience by Design competition uh, process, um, have seen the Esther Commons proposal, and have in general been extremely supportive. So I think that there is leadership. Um, at the level of elected officials and appointed officials in all of those cities and in other jurisdictions, um, not not just cities, but um, other special districts and types of jurisdictions. And um, as Jeanette was saying, that there's also a lot of community interest and so community leaders and um, and uh, others have, have really picked up the SRA common uh, design proposal. I think there's also um, the, the mayor of uh, Oakland, Libby Schaff, um, has actually been working on resilience for quite a long time, and it's actually really impressive the way that that this has been working out. Um, uh, uh, Oakland and San Francisco both have, uh, and Berkeley as well, have chief resilience officers whose positions at the at city governments are paid for through the Rockefeller Foundation um, funds. Um, as many, I'm sure, many of you are familiar with, this has been happening all around the world. And so a year ago, the city of Oakland put out a kind of resilience plan that. This, it, it surely acknowledges climate change, but it actually really addresses resilience much more through questions of housing and economic resilience. And I think it's really smart that in that sense, um, they're, they're seeing resilience as this really complex layered thing that's not just about this blue stuff over here, but I think the, the really kind of complex ecological and social justice questions that it deals with. So I think that's one of the ways in which we're seeing it come forward in, um, and among elected officials. And I think that's very promising. That's great. We got some um, uh, people who would like to see the presentation. I just I, want to remind everybody that we will have a uh, the recording will be on the Open Architecture Collaborative um, YouTube channel. Um, and a uh, couple are asking. Um, oh, I, what actually, um, this this is Brad. I I just I we're having some um, microphone issues here, <laughs> but I wanted to go back to the last question, if that's okay. Okay. Um, I, you know, I, I just wanted to, I think that, um, I don't know the answer to the question, um, but, I, but I think that it, um, the issue of governance um, is a really interesting one here in the Bay Area. Um, there was, several years ago, there was a similar competition or challenge um, in New York after Superstorm Sandy, and it was called uh, Rebuild by Design. And there was, um, it was more of a competition, and there was, there was one proposal that won and is actually being implemented now. And, you know, one of the one of the differences that we realized early on working on this is that there's a big difference between a place like the Bay Area and a place like New York City, because um, the, because the Bay Area, while it's it's sort of one large um, metropolitan region, it's it's um, there's so many different municipalities. I mean, even just our our site that we're working on here with our Estuary Commons project, as I mentioned, touched on three different municipalities, and um, on top of that, there's a lot of like California and and for, for there's a lot of very well-intentioned legislation here that um, you know does a lot of good, but it all also the, the amount of regulation makes it really difficult to have bold visions like this. And and so it really does. Um, I don't know the answer to which which politicians are um, have gotten on board with or are really taking a leadership role with resiliency planning, but um, it really does take leadership from the top because of the sort of fragmented nature of um, of um, of the of the Bay Area, and I think um, some cities like New York, you know, where it's a little bit more, um, it, it's less fragmented. But um, there's other cities like the Bay Area where it's more fragmented. Interesting. Um, how can local community members best advocate for these improvements?
Uh, it's a big question. Um, I think I'm inspired by the way that our partners are operating. Um, so Oakland Climate Action Coalition, for example, is um, working through ways that they can form a kind of eco-district and community-owned solar. Um, the uh, East Oakland Coalition is working on um, greening parts of their neighborhood in ways that can create connections, you know, just being able to connect both the ecological um, aspects of creek frontage with the question of how kids can walk to school in a way that makes them feel safe and value, valued by their neighbors. Um, so, um, and uh, they're also working on um, ways in which collective ownership of sites like the um, uh, the common, uh, oh my God, I just forgot the name, sorry, uh, Planting Justice uh, 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 Community Garden that I showed in the slides are working. So I think we've seen just really fabulous examples in East, Deep East Oakland. I think there are also questions about how a lot of those organizations, which I think are already doing fabulous work, are empowered by their communities and their cities. And um, so I think a lot of the work that we did at RBD was really about um, um, bridging those conversations, sorry, sorry, I'm repeating myself a little bit, but bridging those connections that I think hadn't been happening between, um, for example, the um, managing group that handles the Oakland Coliseum site. Um, that group had not really been talking to community-based organizations. And I think it was important to kind of work through this, the city planning office to kind of make those conversations happen and understand what, where those kind of both conflicts and potentials are between the kind of fear of development on the one side and then this question of, of, of being able to maximize the value of the site on the other. Um, so I, I guess what I'm saying is that I think I see some of the greatest challenges or, or the greatest opportunities as the ones that um, are able to kind of scale up those sort of fabulous efforts that are being done by organizations and sort of empower them within some of the larger structures of decision making at the city scale. That's great. Did you guys um, find any inspiration from other coastal cities or maybe uh, maybe even some examples that you think planning is in the wrong direction? Oh, lots. I mean, we I mean, we looked at coastal cities um, all over the world and, and I think as part of our practice and our there was you know, over the course of more than a year, we had many, many people involved in the All Bay Collective and the Estuary Commons process, and we looked at cities in Europe, Asia, South America, Caribbean. Um, we were inspired by some of the work that's been going on in Germany and in, in the Netherlands. Um, we definitely saw worse practices from some cities as well. <laughs> so, um, yeah, we were, you'll see in, in our report and in some of the images even that were in the, the presentation from today that we um, we borrowed examples that have been implemented in places like the Netherlands and in and, uh, Nordic countries and in Germany um, of, of ways that, that um, sea level rise adaptation has actually been practically implemented. Great. Um, what agency will All Bay Collective have beyond RBD, and will the members continue working together? And under what framework would that be? Thanks for the question. Um, yeah, I think we're still figuring it out. Um, I think we've, you know, it's so interesting. I think through so much of this process, um, you know, this was an eight-month process, and I think so much of the work that we did wasn't just about, you know, doing the research and producing designs. I think so much of the process was about figuring out how to work together and find a common language and a kind of useful exchange among our different disciplinary backgrounds. And so I'm really excited by the way we've kind of learned to do that together, and um, I'm hoping that this, I think we're all hoping that this moves forward in different ways. There have been some first steps um, outlined for that, and a lot of those next steps have to do with our future involvement with the community-based um, process that I described for the Transforming Community, uh, Climate Communities grant. And a lot of that involves making ourselves available for um, training for um, a lot of the decision making makers that are part of that process. Um, a lot of it also involves the transfer of the tools like the, community, the quadruple bottom line and the board game um, to those same groups to use as decision-making tools. Um, and then 
we're also kind of structuring our potential involvement in um, seeing through grant applications and um, uh, sort of design development with agency partners. And that's a huge question mark. And um, I think we'll just have to test, test how that works out. Um, and I, I just wanted to add to that a little bit. I, you know, one of the things that we heard um, from, you know, one of the interesting things about about that I that I found about this process was the the community the community process. I thought was um, it was it was very complex um, just because we had such a large site, um, and in much of the site there's already been master plans proposed, and um, and so you know here we are coming coming and kind of taking a fresh look at work that's already been done by the community members and others. And, um, and, and, and one of the things that we heard is like, you know, there's a lot of really pressing challenges in, in places like deep East Oakland related to gentrification and displacement and health issues, air quality. Um, and then we're, we're trying to talk about these really, um, these, these challenges related to global warming and sea level rise that are very far off. And so, um, Part of the challenge is just like figuring out how to make it relevant to people and and to to engage them. It's it's not it's not easy to talk about um, when there's when there's when there's more immediate challenges that people are facing. It's it's hard to sometimes have a have a conversation about something that's ten or twenty or thirty years down the road, um, and it requires a lot of time and and effort. And I think that you know that's something that if another city is looking at this all this resilient by design challenge that that we did here in the Bay Area um, I would really stress you know that 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 is a big big part of the work and and needs to be um, you know accounted for in in, in, in the process um, it takes a lot of time to to uh, to to get to get people engaged in this conversation and it's and that's critical to to developing a proposal that will actually have legs and be able to to move forward um, after you know after the, the the designs are drawn up. That's great. What were some of the most uh, surprising responses to your community engagement efforts, especially with the In It Together game? That's a great question. Um, I guess there are always surprises, so that's always exciting to see how people respond. Um, I think one of my favorite moments would the game was um, an experience that we had with an after-school program of uh, students, uh, mostly around the uh, um, junior high school level. And so we got about, I don't know, 15 students together and played the game. And um, you could definitely see this moment where it was like everyone felt this tension between whether they should think about you know, their day-to-day -day concerns and think long-term. And this one student was like, wait a second, how do we do both? You know, this just seems so difficult to, to like flip between these two ways of thinking. And so we all just kind of opened up like ways in which we thought that short-term, you know, gains could relate to long-term thinking. And I was just really excited to see that think, thinking open up. I'm not quite sure that it was a surprise, but it was just very, very valuable as, a, as an experience. And then I guess that, you know, I think that relates to what Brad said as well, that um, I think sometimes as designers, we often tend to think that the deliverable is a set of, you know, draw, of, of drawings, that it's, it is this kind of master plan. And I think our process in working with community groups, I think really, as Brad said, it's, it's a process, right? Like it, it takes time to build trust and it takes, takes time to build a way of working. And I think one of the most um, effective things in our discussions with our, with our partners was to say we're not handing you a master plan because you know that's not useful to you. You want to drive a community-driven process. What's useful to you is, or they said that what's useful to us is uh, that you can help us make smart decisions and understand the consequences of our decisions. And so um, I think that I think that was it was it was both tricky to, to realize how we needed to work together, but I think very rewarding to realize that we could, as designers, make many different kinds of tools that make that possible. That's great, Jeanette. Thank you very much. Um, we're out of time. Um, we've got a lot of questions in, but um, uh, I wanted to remind everybody that uh, we will have this presentation on the Open Architecture Collaborative uh, YouTube channel 
And um, also, please uh, check your email. You'll be uh, filling out a, um, a form afterwards, and you can submit any uh, questions that you have there also. We'll get to them. Um, thank you very much, Jeanette, Paul, and Brad. This was a really interesting, uh, inspiring uh, discussion on your work. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. Have a nice day. Bye-bye.